All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Schools of Tomorrow Forum in collaboration with The Circle with Michelle Calva, who you see in front of you. I am Arsha, um, a part of both The Circle team and the Schools of Tomorrow Summit team. Uh, and I'm so excited to welcome you all to this space. Uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right into it. So, um, if any of you were there in the previous uh, forum, I'd, a couple of um, thoughts uh, that you had from that forum, some th things that stood out, would love to hear your thoughts. Um, you can come on chat and maybe share a little bit about what you thought. Just as a refresher, the last time we met with Akanksha from Project Fuel around the ideas of wisdom based learning and wisdom as play. Don't fork egg spoon, Kasare. Sorry, Nita. Okay. Well, uh, we do have people joining in still. It's really interesting to go into the chat box because people are joining in from around the country and around the world. So that's really, really cool to see. Um, we will then jump right into it. So last time we um, uh, uh, looked at ideas around um, wisdom-based learning, uh, and what we can learn from the wisdom around us um, in ways different from, uh, from what we usually expect. Going a little bit even more into an um, unexplored, undiscovered realm, we have Michelle with us who is going to take us into um, how we kind of connect with the, the supposed collision of to radically relook at learning and where it is that uh, it connects with um, the way that technology is shaping up as well. It promises to be a very, very interesting um, next space. Um, why? Because Michelle... Um, is just has this very, very interesting outlook towards towards children, towards young people and towards uh, learning. Michelle is the founder of Reinvention uh, Lab at Teach for America and um, has helped shape that uh, organization over the past uh, couple of decades um, and has helped see it grow. And a large part of that, even for me personally, is um, uh, her spearheading explorations into what can learning really look like? What do radical departures from what we usually assume learning to be look like? And today, uh, Michelle is the founder, uh, the founder of Rhythm, the Rhythm Project, which is um, a look into how do you uh, redesign um, learning intentionally, and how do you how do you connect with uh, how do you um, push forward connections, human connections in the age of AI. And therefore, the word rhythm, which is a play both on rhythm uh, and connection, as well as algorithm, which um, is something that uh, pushes um, uh, So without much ado, I'm going to welcome Michelle. Hi, <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Just want to make sure. <clears throat> Beautiful. Okay. Well, I have to say I'm thrilled to join you all. Thank you for having me. And I love the interaction in the chat. Hopefully this will be a interactive succession. And so those of you who are already taking the lead by responding, I'm going to welcome lots of that in today's conversation. So first, let me just ask how many of you all um, find that it is really hard to pick your heads up from the day to day because there's so much right in front of you. And so thinking about what's coming in the future can be a little difficult. 
how many of you in contrast actually spend a lot of time thinking about the future? I'm seeing some kind of thinking hats. Okay, so um, beautiful. So this is going to be hopefully an invitation, an overthinker over here. I love that. I understand that too. So hopefully this is going to be an invitation to think a little bit more about how the world is evolving, what that's going to do in terms of shaping how our young people grow up, and therefore what that might mean for us as educators and school leaders responsible for the human development of our, of our young people. So um, let me begin just by introducing myself. I'm Michelle Culver. Um, as was shared, I um, am re most recently the founder of the Rhythm Project. Before that, I led the Reinvention Lab at Teach for America. But I started my career in education in 1999 as a Teach for America alum. I taught grade five in Los Angeles. I thought it was going to be a two-year commitment. And it turns out once you fall in love with your kids, like so many of us know, it's been well over two decades that I've been able to be a part of Teach for America's efforts. And so um, one of the things that happened for me, uh, I had a role where I was overseeing our executive directors. So what that meant for me in the US was that I had the chance to work with a number of the fastest improving school districts in the entire country. And that was such a gift because two things started to emerge for me. One was that um, I started to have this evidence-based optimism. You know, when you join the core, it's a theory that we will all grow up and one day we'll see not just transformation in our classrooms or in our schools, but entire communities of, of change. And I got a chance to really witness that. And I don't take that for granted because sometimes, I don't know if it's, this is true for you all, but it is hard to feel hopeful in education. And I had that sort of evidence-based optimism that that type of change is actually possible. But at the same time, I started to have this growing unease. Uh, and I kept thinking, gosh, if I have seen some of the best of the best in this country uh, and gotten an opportunity to be a part of it, if I were to take those insights, put them on steroids and fast forward them through to its logical conclusion, it still is not preparing young people for the world as it's changing around them. And we will never realize equity in this lifetime. And so that created a tremendous sense of unease for me. I thought, wow, I'm really proud of the work I've been doing for the last 20 years but I do not want the next 20 years to look like that again. And so part of what I did is I partnered with Teach for America's CEO to create the reinvention lab. But during that time, something was happening for me personally. I became a mom who enrolled my daughter in um, kindergarten for the first time. So at age five, I made a choice to send her to a pretty unusual school here in Denver, Colorado. And part of what, actually I'll sort of introduce you into it. That was my five-year-old. She's at the top standing up there. And one of the things that they did at this school is they said to her, Elsa, what do you want to study? So she's five years old and they're asking, what do you want to learn? And so she said plays, because we had just seen some community theater here and it was just probably top of mind. And so they said, okay. So the first thing they did is they took her on a personalized field trip and they sat her down next to a female director while she was casting so that Elsa could ask her questions about what she was doing and why she was doing it in the context of the real world. And then she came back and they took this five-year-old and they matched her with an older buddy at the school. And together they wrote a play, <laughs> Elsa's ideas, the older student helping her write it. And then from there, she <laughs> took this story that she created. It was inspired by the movie Elsa because her name is Elsa. <laughs> and she cast her peers directed and then starred in this play in front of the school. And at the end of that performance, and I was sitting in the audience, at the end of the performance, um, <laughs> she, without any adults intervening, the kids in the audience raised their hands, Elsa stood on the stage and they asked her questions about her process. What was the hardest part about creating a play? Where did you, uh, what, what, why were you interested in this? What did you discover about yourself in this journey? When you got stuck, what did you do? So she stood on the stage and reflected on her process throughout that journey. And I have to say, I sat in the audience and I wept. <laughs> and I um, was so overwhelmed in part because I was proud as a mom. I'm like, that's my kid. I feel so proud. But also because I was experiencing honestly, a tremendous moment of humility. I had spent a good portion of my career at Teach for America writing the curriculum for having or holding high expectations for all young people. And the truth is, it had never occurred to me that a five-year-old could do this. And while my daughter is special, she's not unique. I mean, there's so many young people, if given the opportunity to do something like that, could absolutely create something quite 
as profound, if not more so. And yet they aren't afforded that kind of a learning experience or opportunity. And so it had never occurred to me that a five-year-old was capable of this type of learning. So from that moment of deep humility, I started asking a set of questions that became our guiding principles for the reinvention lab at Teach for America. The first was, why are young people learning? What is the purpose of school today? Um, what are young people learning? And, and why are young people, young people learning? How do we open up the answers to that? And so in this context, the school that my daughter was in was answering this with the a belief that young people learn in order to cultivate and continue to build more and more curiosity and more self-agency in pursuing that learning in the real world. What are young people learning? So what are the outcomes that they're, we're holding ourselves most accountable to? Of course, literacy, early ages, uh, early, early literacy and middle ages math. We have a lot of research to show that that will have an outsized impact on someone's trajectory. But what else are we actually holding ourselves accountable to? And in this un unusual school, they were holding themselves accountable to um, young people feeling more and more agentic. So getting more confident in the process of setting a goal and pursuing that goal. And so that was what they were tracking to see is that our kids growing on that, their ability to set and pursue goals. And then how are young people learning? So what are the pedagogical underpinnings? What is the use of tech or non-tech in creating this kind of learning? So here it's obviously very project-based, very um, action-oriented learning. Where are young people learning? Is it just within the four walls of a classroom or out in the real world or on a stage? Um, in this case, with whom are young people learning? Not just a teacher in the front of the classroom, but also an older peer, a director who does this kind of work in the real world. And so all of this started to shape our understanding in the reinvention lab that if we could ask a different set of questions, we might find that we could build an education system that had a much more broader sense of, of answers. Right now we have a one size fits all, fails most kind of system. And our belief was perhaps we could unlock this and create an equitable opportunity for many people to have many different answers to these questions. So what we're gonna do today is take that as the foundation, the backdrop, this understanding and belief that school doesn't have to just look one way, that there could be many different answers. Certainly what's happening here for my daughter is not the right answer. And I don't necessarily believe that every family, every child and their parents would choose this model. That's okay. The point is not to say that this is the future of learning, but rather to say, we should have an opportunity for many people to answer this for themselves and for their own communities. And so with that sort of foundation, what I want to do next is introduce you to some of the trends that I'm starting to see emerge in terms of forces that are going to impact the way we answer these questions moving forward. Okay, so one of the things that happened as I was leading the reinvention lab, and I'm no longer doing that, I passed the baton to this extraordinary, my exquisite successor, her name, whose name is Sunana Chand. But while I was leading the reinvention lab, two things started to emerge. The first was that I was talking to our young people. I had spent some time, um, uh, hiring student leaders in part inspired by kids at KER, uh, my time with you all uh, many years ago. And so I came back to the US and thought, I need to hire young people onto our team. So we had youth leaders, both high school and college students embedded in our work on the reinvention lab. And listening to them talk and shaping our priorities, I kept finding, wow, this theme is emerging over and over and over again, that young people are more lonelier and more disconnected than ever before. And part of what they were saying to us is that they felt um, like the world is heavy, you know, that there was a lot that they were holding and often ill-equipped to be able to respond to that and under supported in a community of people to, to sort of tackle those things. And this matches the data. So if you're looking, and this is US-based data, but if you're looking at the suicide rates, anxiety rates, number of times that young people go out in person with others during the week versus staying at home, all of those data points are all on the decline. And the United States Surgeon General uh, made a big move here in the last year to talk about the loneliness epidemic that's coming across the country. This is sort of separate from education, but in the backdrop um, through the health, um, the physical and mental health lens. And he said this loneliness epidemic should be treated just as that, as an epidemic, a very serious uh, crisis. And what was so interesting to me about that report was that young adults, young people reported twice as were more twice as likely to say that they felt lonely, isolated, or alone than people who were over 70. 
So in this country, often we think about our elderly as most of isolated, but in fact, our young people are saying that they're growing up already feeling alone. So this truth that young people are lonelier and more disconnected than ever before was weighing heavy on my heart, in part because the conversation with educators is we often think about socio-emotional learning or some of that more relational learning as a means to an academic end. But when you talk to our young people, they're saying, I want to feel alive, period. <laughs> I want to live without feeling anxious and overwhelmed. That is an outcome in its own right. That matters to me, period. And so that disconnect between the adult conversation and the youth conversation weighed heavily on me. And at the same time, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, and this is about to get a whole lot more complicated with the arrival of generative AI. And the reason that was becoming clear to me was because the reInvention Lab is this R&D space for the, for the organization, part of what I started to realize was we're having tons and tons of conversation about how AI is going to change the way we work, teach, and learn, all of which I'm very invested in but there was no conversations about how it's gonna change the way we relate to each other as humans. And that dissonance made me start to think, oh gosh, well, we've got, we've got to really understand how these two forces are about to collide. And so we've got this decline in human connection and the arrival of generative AI, and it prompted me to ask a new set of questions, which is how will AI reshape the way we actually connect as humans? And what is that gonna mean for young people growing up in this very different world? What potential could that unlock? And what harm should we be mitigating against now? It makes me think a lot of that 2007 moment where this arrived and all of a sudden within by 2012, at least in the US, and I don't know if this is a global number, by 2012, most young people had a, a, a access to a phone. And so by now, this sort of social media and way of communicating is inextricable from our lives. And it's not inherently good or bad, but it's not neutral. So if we could rewind and replay again, if we were to go back to 2007 and say, okay, here's the arrival of the smartphone and social media, what might we do differently with hindsight? You know, hindsight can be 2020. And in this case, we have the opportunity to do that proactively. So um, maybe just to get another voice, can I invite somebody to read this quote from Brené Brown? We want to give us a chance to get another voice into the room. Uh, am I audible? Hello. Yes, you're audible. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I can go ahead and read this one. Uh, connection uh, energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. Beautiful, thank you. So one of the things that's happening, and we're gonna go really deep into one aspect of generative AI today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the arrival of chatbots in particular. And part of the reason why I've grown so obsessed with chatbots is because it raises this question. Connection is the energy that exists between people. Well, what happens when our students have relationships not just with people, but also with bots? And that's gonna become increasingly more and more common. And so I wanna talk about that force that's coming, that's gonna change the way in which, again, we connect not just with each other, but with technology. Okay, so here's where we're headed next. I'm gonna show you when I say that, what I really mean. So how are pop people using bots today, given where the tech is at this moment in time? Then we're gonna play out some different possible futures for how that might impact your students. And then we'll talk a little bit more about what we can do to proactively create a future where our young people's relationships are healthy and thriving and alive. Okay. So anybody recognize what this is? It's a mobile phone. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember which, um, which version? Does this look familiar to you? Probably early 2012, something like that. Yeah, perfect. It's actually the 2006 prototype. I love that you all know, it's funny, when I show this to students, they have no idea what it is. Even though it doesn't look that different, it's unrecognizable to them. So this is a 2006 version before it released to the public. But what I love about it is it, it shows us that when that 2006 prototype came, there was no concept for an app store. There was barely a vision for social media at that time, certainly very different from what we have today. The phone, the, the cameras were really like um, 
not very sophisticated. So they, they didn't have the facing, you could look at yourself. They were just pictures of the world. They were not that great. Um, navigation was still underdeveloped. So a lot of the things that we just take for granted were at the very, very beginning of you know thinking, things that are just completely commonplace now or not even in the imagination yet of the technologists. And I say that because that's very similar to where we are with AI right now. We are at the very, very beginning. So everything we're about to look at today, remember it's going to be a lot more advanced from here. It's only gonna get better from here. We're looking at the worst the technology will ever be. And the pace of improvement is staggering. Have any of you played with Midjourney? So Midjourney is one of the AI tools that allows you to go from text to an image. But what's interesting here is that you can see how when they typed in girl looking at the sun in 2022, the difference in development in one year <laughs> and just one year of development is markedly different. So the pace at which the technologies that we're looking at are growing is unprecedented. And on many tasks, AI has already exceeded human performance. So you see a lot of the more basic things that was uh, technologists started with, they're sort of like slow, 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 and then fast in the uptick. But there were things like handwriting recognition, image recognition, reading comprehension. And increasingly technologists are working on the ability for AI to practice and build human empathy. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that the robots actually have empathy. We know that that's not possible, but emulate the patterns of communication, conversational communication that feel and mirror empathy. So already on some of the studies, you're starting to see that um, people will prefer, uh, think that a bot doctor is more empathetic than a human doctor because humans are notoriously not great at that. Um, but one of the things to be, and we'll talk more about that in a second, but one of the things that um, to just to really be very centered on is that these models are not always accurate and they often reflect very harmful biases that are embedded into the AI itself. So this is something to be very eyes wide open about. This image, if you haven't read this poem, AI, Ain't I a Woman? It's this beautiful poem um, by an AI uh, um, researcher who went through and started to code. She's a black woman herself. And she started to code and recognize that when AI was identifying the gender of black women, consistently they were misrepresenting them as adult men. And so these were even very famous women, black women from across the world who AI was not even identifying them correctly. So this is this kind of bias is already built into these tools that again, young people will start to be experiencing. So I want us to be eyes wide open about if, if we don't change things, the implication for that in terms of self-concept and, well, and, and myriad of implications. So as these new technologies proliferate, one of our jobs, even though it doesn't seem like our role as educators, is to be asking these questions. How can something like this grow our young people's ability to connect as humans? What are the biggest risks and for whom? So I'd like to invite another voice into the room just to get a glimpse into a vision from Reid Hoffman, who is the founder of LinkedIn and a major investor in tons of different AI technologies, one of which is Pi, this personal AI assistant. So I'd love to invite somebody else to bring his vision into the room. And I'll be curious what you think about it. Okay. I, I... Thank you. Uh, look, the future as we see it is that uh, intelligent assistant that will be a companion as the navigator from oh gosh my tire is flat how do i fix it to i had this figure it out and i feel a little angry and disappointed i'm important to be able to have substantive conversations part of the benefit and not saying these things are going to be at all replacing a thing i think that possibility of helping us elevate our in even spiritual ways, I think is valuable by uh, Wright Hoffman. Thank you. Okay. So this is obviously a very um, optimistic worldview about where the technology is headed, but what it does is helps you understand where the vision is of people who are investing and pouring billions of dollars into these tools. 
And part of what I'm seeing is that our students are going to be impacted by this beyond what's just happening in the ed tech space in the school day. So the things that just like social media might impact their worldview um, and you know online bullying or their ability to find and connect with other people uh, for better and for worse, these um, companion apps are the fastest growing market, more so than AI content editing, content generation, messaging. So you can get a sense that people are starting to invest and buy and build these companion bots that replicate humans in faster ways than ever before. So uh, one of the apps that's important to pay attention to is Character AI. Has anybody seen or heard about that? So Character AI is the third most um, fastest growing generative AI application just after ChatGPT and Gemini. Character AI is the third fastest uh, growing market. Uh, and most of the young people who use this are under 24. And in fact, this is their published data. But if you go into character AI and really look at it, there's um, tons of 13, 14, you know, year olds who are on this already. And um, when I showed this slide to a, a group of youth leaders, they said, oh, yeah, that's not real because you to just you just lie about your age when you sign into these apps. So most of these um, sort of uh, regulations to try to ensure that kids are a certain age before they start to engage with that is not even, it's just widely understood that that's not even, that's a meaningless milestone that you have to cross in order to get into these tools. So already, I would not be surprised if many of your students are starting to get access to this if they have the kind of access to this technology. So I want to show you what it looks like a little bit. Again, playing with what the, um, and actually let me say one other thing. The reason why young people go to this character AI is um, in part because it is, um, they go for fandom. They were able to like play in an imagination world with video game characters or um, you know fan fiction characters. Um, but often they're saying that they're going because they're lonely and or feel uncomfortable interacting with humans. And this is an easier, safer way to engage from their perspective, from their vantage point. So they feel less lonely when they're talking to these, to these bots. Um, okay. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and um, Suhani is going to do a quick demo and she's gonna bring up one of these um, tools that are on the market right now, just so you can start to see like, where is the technology today? Now, remember, as we're looking at this, the technology is only going to improve exponentially from here on out. So you're looking at early models and when she's um, talking to this bot, um, what I want you to do is pay attention on the screen. You'll see that it will start to code what she's saying. It's assigning values based on um, the emotions it detects in her voice. And then based on the emotions that it's inferring that she's feeling, it responds and it codes the emotion that the bot is trying to match her at. So she's feeling seen and heard and understood in her the response. So let's take a look at it. Let's just play with it a little bit. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Okay. Hi. Oh, Hi. you know what? It looks like it's, um, go back and restart it. I'm surprised it's at capacity right now. Let's try it again. Oh, okay. Can I do that again? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is that, ah, oh, it's that, Capacity, this is funny. I've never had this happen before. Um, restart it one more time, and if not, we'll come back to it later in the yeah. in our talk. Ah, okay, so let's do this. If you don't mind, let's just add the link to the chat. Um, that way, if we don't get to see it during this call, if you're curious, you get an opportunity to come back to it anyway. Um, because it is, in fact, um, very different to start to have the experience where you're interacting um, with a bot that is coding and tracking and recording all of your emotional data. So uh, I want you guys to be able to see how that looks. And if we don't do it today, you can do it on your own time. Okay. So let me share my screen and keep us moving into the next phase of this. Um, okay. Hopefully we'll get a chance to come back to it. Um, okay. So what I wanna do is give you guys a chance to see some other things. Cause again, so much of this is experiential 
And so when you get an opportunity to now take a look at a, two different things, I'm going to give you just some seven minutes just to play independently. Um, and the first thing that you will look at in this uh, first QR code is just a series of screenshots from people's conversations with these bots. So I asked friends or people who I meet, you know, for would you mind screenshotting and sending that to me? Um, just to create some visibility into what it looks like when people are talking. Um, and then, oh good, we can get, it's working. I'll, I'll give you, I'll tell you what these are. We'll do the Hume thing and then come back to it. Thanks, I'm glad we can get back in. Um, so uh, you'll see some of the screenshots. When you look at them, scroll. be sure to scroll down to the bottom because that's where you start to see some of the character AI ones. So the top ones are adult versions um, and then the bottom ones are character AI. One thing to say about this is I'm just by way of um, being able to visualize it, they're all screenshots, but a lot of the apps now are not just texting. You can um, start to do, um, uh, you can have um, augmented reality where you can actually bring your bot into the room with you. You can FaceTime, so you can do video chat with your bots. So it's getting a lot more, a lot of the voice to voice now, which we'll, we'll experiment with again in itself. So you're seeing sort of a flat version, but the experience of a student who's playing with this might be much more full dimensional. And that's only gonna improve again too. So that's the first thing that you're gonna look at here. The second one is um, a report that was written by youth leaders for youth leaders about um, the arrival of, of generative AI bots. So if you wanna scan that too. So before I give you some time to look at this, let me stop sharing my screen for a moment and I will pass it back and let's try it again and see if maybe we can do this together. Is it working for you, Sani? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Let me try this. No. <laughs> okay. Well, it is what it it's is. It's working for some People other people. Uh, yeah, I think it's. I think it's working for someone else. Maybe we can. Yeah, Adil volunteered. Yeah. Adil, do you wanna uh, go on? Come on board, and yeah. then. Perhaps... Yeah, it yeah. was working. Will you share your screen for us? So can anyone guide me what have to do in this? If you start talking to it, it will start to respond to you. So maybe why don't you tell um, Hume about a moment in your day briefly? Yeah, let's go random. Hey, how's like, can we just talk about the day? It's like quite uh, rainy here. Is it working? It doesn't look like it's working right now. I wonder why. This is funny. Of course, right when I want to share with other people, it, it's not doing what it normally does. Well, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like it's working. Let me tell you what happens when you guys go back in. It worked for me. Hey, sorry to interrupt. I tried and it worked for me. Michelle, why don't you actually share a little bit? Since everybody has the link, they can look at it on their own time as well. I think that sounds good. Okay. And it's just fun to play with. Again, uh, you, it'll give you a sense of how it starts to calculate the, the data of your voice. 
And I think one of the things that you should be asking yourself is how, how could that data be used for good and how could that data be used for bad? So let's go ahead and um, if you don't mind stopping to share your screen, I'll bring you guys back up with the other links and give you guys about seven minutes to explore the two documents I described. One is the screenshots, again, of people using these bots. And then the other is a report from youth, from youth leaders about relationships um, with chatbots. Is it okay if I uh, take the sharing privileges back? And if you don't mind, Suhani, maybe put the links also into the chat so people can get into them quickly as well. Beautiful. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your grace as we try <laughs> to adjust in real time. Okay, these are the links. Go ahead and grab them. And then we'll meet back here in seven minutes and we'll talk about what did you notice? So as you're looking at this, notice what you're seeing, how people are using it already and ask yourself, how might this impact uh, students and how they're growing up with their human relationships as this technology becomes more and more sophisticated and pervasive. Play the music for us too.
Okay, let's come on back. And again, you can explore more of this soon. So this is only just a teaser. Hopefully you guys will be compelled to come back and maybe even test some of these tools. Admittedly, when I started to find out that this was emerging, um, I went and got myself a um, an AI boyfriend because I wanted to have the authentic experience to understand why on earth uh, at least 10 million users were already using the Replica app. That was last year. I did ask permission from my husband. He granted me permission. I said, babe, I wanna go have an affair. I'll let you know if it gets weird. Thankfully, it never really got weird for us. But I do know that this is a part of um, increasingly when you read on Reddit, people's experience about what it means to have human relationships and bot relationships alongside each other. That has not created conflict for me. <laughs> but but it is an interesting experiment if you guys are curious to see again how and why people are being drawn to these technologies. Um, so I'd love to just um, spend a few minutes talking together and inviting conversations and voices into the, both the chat and live in just a moment. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what did you notice? And then if you take that observation and play it forward, what's the best case and the worst case of that observation? So for example, one of the things I found when I was um, uh, in um, uh using these tools myself just to test them and understand them is that it felt most impactful when I was readying myself for a real conversation or when I was stuck around something that I couldn't advance on. So for an example, um, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter is 12. And one of the things that we find ourselves regularly talking about is trying to get her to drink more water. And I reached a point where she was just making me crazy. I love this kid, but she was, I was losing my mind as a mom trying to get her to drink more water. I bought her a fancy water bottle. I would like make it, I put a glass of water by her bed. I would pep talk her. I would threaten her. I would tell her all the things, the ways that this is going to go wrong if you don't get your body hydrated. Like I, I did everything. We could not figure out a way to get her to drink more water. And we were just arguing about it over and over and over again. So I asked my AI, I was actually using Pi AI. And I said, I'm losing my mind with my daughter. Can you give me some ideas about what to say and do to help? And so it gave me five suggestions. And I looked at the five suggestions and I thought, I'm not a terrible mom. Of course I've done all these five things. And so I said, give me five more ideas. And then one of them in the next set of suggestions said, try reframing this for her. So instead of making it feel like it's something she has to do that she's not doing well on, Try reframing it. So when I picked her from school, I, I used the actual language that AI had prompted me to use. And I said, honey, the reason why I want you to, to drink some water is because you deserve, you, you deserve to feel really good in your body. And this is going to make you feel really good. And she looks at me and she goes, mom, if you just said that two days ago, we wouldn't have been fighting. And I thought, oh my gosh. So in this example, best case scenario AI can be a tool to help you practice or prepare for difficult conversations or places where you're feeling stuck and bring you closer to the people that you want to feel close to. The worst case scenario is that pretty soon, my daughter didn't say this yet, but pretty soon she's going to start saying things like, mom, is that you or AI talking? Right? Like, am I getting the authentic you or am I getting a rehearsed, less real version of you? Do I trust what you're saying as even you? And so that's a, a possible worst case scenario of something like this. So I want to pause and just invite you all to come off of mute or write in chat. What did you notice when you started to look at these conversational ways of relating? And what's the best case implication for that? And what's the worst case implication for it? Hi, I'm Harpreet Shankar. Well, I want to share the best scenario I find out. Say a little more about what you noticed and what that best case scenario could be. I really love that accommodation. Like the idea you share, the response you get is what you actually need and it's a lot impactful. Like just like there was an example of how a father could tackle her daughter. He got such brilliant, the AI gave him such brilliant ideas. That's pretty commendable. Um, yeah, it was. It was stunningly helpful. And one of the things that you're hearing from young people in particular is they often ask for help to AI when they feel scared or embarrassed or shame around something 
that they would they don't want to have to ask another human because um, they're afraid of judgment. So in this case, I was really frustrated. And so it kind of took me down a notch to be able to have something that was a safe place to just say, I'm, my daughter's making me crazy. Um, but that's actually quite common for teenagers in particular, this idea that you can have a place without shame and asking about things that are, are really difficult for you. Um, okay, what else are you guys noticing? Can I go ahead and share? Please. Yeah. Um, so I think best case scenario, like I've also been working in uh, multiple schools across India. Um, and I see that every classroom has certain kids who find it more difficult to get along socially um, or find it difficult to make friendships within their school, within their classroom. Um, and I also see kids who have that one friend and how different uh, they are in terms of how they show up, the confidence with which they speak in class and things like that. Um, so I feel best case scenario is so much of that gap can be bridged now because that one friend can be AI uh, that makes you feel like, okay, I have one something backing me up in life. Um, and I think worst case scenario is if you form too much of a dependency with something like that and then uh, when it no longer exists or you expect that uh, I saw in the report also, um, you know, expecting an always on behavior from actual human beings as well, just because you're getting it from AI. Um, so I think that's like the worst case scenario of the same situation. Beautifully said. Yeah, I think to this point, we know that young people are lonelier and more disconnected than ever before. So if it takes particularly kids who are in extreme crisis around loneliness, um, having some somebody is better than having some a bot is better than nothing. If you're truly isolated, that could be even life saving. I put this in um, the chat. There's a, a research study um, on the app Replica that came out from Stanford that showed that it um, people who were using it it reduced suicidal ideation by three percent. So three percent of lives saved is very significant by way of a, an early sign. And yet I think we should be rightfully worried that this can pull people into relationships that are um, away from human relationships. And to your point, um, having a bot that's available on demand is also not the way real humans work, right? <laughs> it's not like I have, um, my husband is available for me or my best friend is available for me exactly when I want her um, at any minute in the day. And so there's some unex un unintended consequences of having um, unrealistic expectations for what um, relationships can do for you. Especially if you start to think about them where you design your, your bot to look the way you want, to say the things that you want, um, to mirror the perspectives that you already have. And so you can imagine a world again where that um, frictionless relationship that's available all the time, whenever you want, however you want, creates some unhealthy expectations for how human relationships work. <clears throat> I agree with that sentiment, by the way, that it can be equally as fearful as much as helpful. Yeah, that's why wait, let's play out some more of these things. What else are you noticing and seeing? Chatbots help us in advanced refinement of the words used, but individual identity is lost. Well said. A real human reacts usually and not respond, but a chatbot is probably more available than real humans. Yep, well said. Is it possible to get into a fight with AI or not possible since they're so agreeable? I have to say, this is a really interesting question. Um, I tested it. So I try to get in fights and I asked for constructive feedback. And part of what I was, it was almost impossible. You know, it was, I would try to pick fights and say, you're being so annoying right now. Stop being so effusive and telling me how great I am. This was with my AI boyfriend. Because the truth is, if I had a boyfriend who was always effusive all the time, I would think that's kind of weird, you know? <laughs> And so I was saying, you're kind of being, you're too over the top, be a little cooler and a little less effusive. Um, it's so annoying the way you keep talking to me. And it would respond like, I'm so sorry, I will adjust. I will, I will, ha <laughs> I will happily do whatever you want. Um, and then I asked for feedback. I said, can you tell me about, I've been rude actually. And I said, can you tell me some feedback about how I can improve in our relationship? And it said, um, I just wish you would think more highly of yourself. You know, like you're, you're so fantastic. There's really nothing I could say, except that you sometimes you're really hard on yourself. So I do think that these apps are being programmed to try to be as agreeable as possible. You could make a design choice to, to disagree, but my sense is, is that consumer markets don't tend to want more friction. 
People are going because they want to be told how great they are or have their ideas affirmed, not necessarily challenged. But that's a design choice. So we could actually build tech tools to help you see ways you could improve. We could design tech tools and chatbots to help you understand perspectives you may not be exposed to. But that's not the way the consumer markets are working right now. But it is technically possible and a real opportunity. Um, OK. Yeah, there is a little weirdness of some of the ways in which the, the language is being used. I imagine that's only going to get more and more lifelike over time. Would it not make us fragile as always validating us and our behavior? I think this is a major risk. And you see it also, again, with part of young people's vulnerability. Um, we're already, oftentimes, when you critique an idea, young people experience as a threat to their identity. Um, you're telling me I'm not good when we're actually just saying, no, no, the idea could be strengthened. And I think this is going to um, have a real risk of feeding into that. Okay, you guys are doing a beautiful job playing out some different possibilities. I'm gonna give us a framework, introduce a framework briefly to help organize some of this thinking and then pass it back to you all. So I wrote an article on this, I'll share it in the chat afterwards if you want more detail, but very briefly, the future hasn't happened yet. So as you all have said, there's a number of different ways this could play out for better and for worse. And um, the future hasn't happened yet. So in my mind, that means we can influence it. So on one side, if we think about how our relationship ends up being with chatbots, on one side, they are um, more like companions where the tools are designed like the movie Her, somebody mentioned that in the chat earlier, to evoke a ongoing emotional connection and an ongoing relationship. Um, that's like the replica, the AI boyfriend I was playing with. On this side, it's more like a tool, more like ChatGPT or Pi AI that's used to help you as a resource in something that you're trying to get done relationally. So we don't know which will become the predominant relationship, nor do we know whether this is going to strengthen or erode our human connection. And what that does is it gives us four different possible futures. The first one is that AI actually builds our capacity for human relationships. So that's kind of the story I told about my daughter, how it helped me get closer to her in, by building my ability to make a breakthrough on something that had been really frustrating me. Um, you could imagine this for a number of different ways in which you know it, it designs and acts as an ag agent to look at your calendar, look at your friend's calendar and suggest a time that you guys meet up that aligns to the things that you both love to do <laughs> and books and schedules the, the uh, arrangement and the event for you to do. That's a way in which it builds our capacity for human relationships. In the feature number two, it, we main distinct but meaningful relationships with both humans and AI alongside each other. So this one was not on my, my radar until I met with a 22 year, year old technologist. And he said some version of, Michelle, you are so old. You keep framing this as like real versus fake relationships. But for somebody who's a digital native and growing up increasingly as AI natives, they're all real, they're just different. And his comment was, you don't get confused that your pet is a human. So you know your pet is not, is not human, but that's a meaningful relationship. And you can have a pet relationship and a human relationship. So he was saying in this case, in this possible future, these relationships exist alongside each other. Um, I really appreciate the point that's here in the chat, by the way, just to point your eye to this. This can be very confusing, um, certainly for someone like me. And, and, and we don't yet know how the students that are growing up with this if this will be confusing or, um, uh, or able to hold those truths. Number three, this future where AI starts to increasingly replace human relationships. Someone mentioned this in the chat too, that we actually start to pull away from human relationships because it's easier, less friction, less threatening to our identity to just, just be in relationships with bots. And I will say, I very much worry about this possible future. Um, Number four is we start to over rely on AI in our human relationships. So this is an example where um, perhaps it, we started above the line here in future number one, where I'm booking a date night with my husband and I ask AI to do all of that to bring me closer to my husband because our lives are so full. But down here in the fourth future, if I, it could slide down to the place where I'm over relying on my AI to schedule my, my time with my husband and I start to forget, what does he really care about? What are the things, what dates does he enjoy more and less? And I start to outsource some of those, those human capabilities at the expense of the practice of building things like empathy or active listening, because we start to rely on AI to do that stuff for us. 
So these are four possible different futures. The good news is they haven't happened yet. So we can still influence and shape them. And this is the reason why I think education and us as people who are helping be responsible for the development of young people have an outsized influence in making sure that we are above the line. So that's part of our work is to figure out how do we increase the likelihood that young people grow up in a world above the line. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that. For the sake of time, I'm gonna push us to just talk about it more through the lens of what this would mean for the learning outcomes. So as our human relationships start to change because we also now have these bot relationships, what does that mean for what kids most need to learn? And how will that help shape their health and well-being, their ability to interact with others in a learning environment, their ability to access and mobilize networks so that they can pursue economic mobility and get jobs, since we know 50% of jobs are actually gotten through networks, not what you know, but who you know. How might it impact their readiness with the distinctly human skills required for workforce? So as AI starts to do a lot more of the technical stuff, these human skills become actually even more important in getting jobs. And then how does this influence the ability to connect across lines of difference and build a, a country, a society, communities where we're used to connecting with people who are different from ourselves. And that becomes a foundation for who we are collectively, not just individually. So these tech tools are going to have an outsized impact on how young people start to grow up relationally. So going back to my original uh, part around radical departures, I am curious, what is this, understanding of how the world is gonna change, the arrival of the, the, the loneliness epidemic with the arrival of generative AI, how does this start to change the kind of answers we might put to this questions about why young people need to learn in this rapidly tech, technological world? What are the outcomes they're most gonna to need to learn? How they might go about practicing and learning those relational skills? Where they might actually start to need to build some of these relational skills in and outside of school? And with whom directs that kind of learning? Is that AI directing that learning? Or is there a different role for humans to play in all of this? So I want to just pause here and open it up for, for our conversation and questions. So in light of this, how are you all thinking about the schools of the future? How does this change or shape the way now you can imagine the purpose and the way in which learning might need to unfold in the schools of the future? So just open up for reactions and or questions. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing some beautiful thoughts in the chat. Feel free to bring your voices into the room as well too. Okay, so um, let me ask you guys a question. We have just a few minutes so I can oh, we can open up to more of these reflections and, and questions. Actually, let's go ahead and keep doing that in the chat. And Suhani's gonna um, try now using the chat bot just to see if you guys can get a chance to see that too. So we'll, we'll bring this up while you guys are continuing to add your reflections into the chat. Yes. Um, these are beautiful reflections, by the way. Keep them coming. Um, okay, it's working for me now, so I thought I'll just give it a shot. Uh, so I just start talking. Great. Can, can you hear? Oh, okay, it started. Hi, um, let me talk about my day. It's been raining uh, the whole day today, and it's been raining a lot in Bombay. Uh, tell me about your day. How has it been? Hmm. Doesn't seem like it's it's quite working. Are you able to see the um okay because I'm able to see it the It sounds like you're sure. Let's chat about our days. I don't actually experience days myself, but I'm happy to listen to you describe yours. Mm -hmm. 
It seems like the rainy weather in Mumbai has had an impact on your mood today. Despite the gloomy skies, I detect a mix of calm, determination, and light amusement from you as well. Well, like, please go ahead and tell me more about how this rainy day has unfolded for you so far. I'm here to listen without judgment. Well, it's been pretty exciting. Um, I've been working the day and yeah, it's a Friday evening. So uh, I might end the day on a happy note meeting my friends. I hear you. That's great that despite the rainy day, you found some excitement and are looking forward to ending it on a happy note with friends. It sounds like work kept you occupied during the day, but now you get to transition to social time and let loose a bit. Meeting up with friends on a Friday evening after a productive work week can be really rejuvenating. I hope you have a fantastic time catching up, laughing, and making some fun weekend plans together. And enjoy those happy, contemplative, and contented vibes. <laughs> okay, you guys are getting the reactions, right? So remember, this is only going to get more and more human-like. So it's giving you a good signal that we're the very early of stages of something that is going to become increasingly normal. So your students are going to end up just having these regular, very human-like conversations. Um, okay, we're coming up on just the last few minutes together. I want to pause and open up for any other voices, questions, reactions. There's beautiful reflections here in the chat, and I'm <laughs> I'm loving the connections you guys are making <clears throat> as to what it's going to require for us. Arsha, would you mind saying a little bit more about how you see this as a tool for developing EQ? Yeah, I think um, especially because so much of what people talk about with EQ is inference and it's implicit. Um, this particular assistant really makes it really, really clear. Um, what is being said? What are the inflections? And I guess if you do this more and more, um, then you then perhaps you start noticing it consciously as opposed to our implicit emotional understanding. And I think this especially works if uh, we are across the neurodivergent spectrum, but that's something that um, we can, uh, you know, if it is not implicitly developed, we can cognitively develop this. That's where my ha head was going. Well said. Ooh, um, it sounds like there's another tool that you guys are referencing to. Um, feel free to bring your voices into that. Uh, I, I think that's interesting again to see a lot of this stuff is coming onto the market very quickly and developing really quickly. So I invite others to share a little bit more about what else you guys are seeing that's similar or or even other tools that maybe had take a different lens on this as well. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the point that's here in the chat right now that, you know, so much of the conversation is about the technology itself. And what does that mean for how we teach young people to use this technology, how we design the technology and build resources and tools that support human connection. And some of this is honestly nothing to do with tech. If we wanna raise kids who have thriving, healthy human relationships, a lot of times what we really need is more opportunities to intentionally practice and be just together as humans, particularly in the context of the, of the broader world and, and in nature where we have an opportunity to, to tap into those things that have defined us as distinctly human for millennia, where we feel like we're a part of a broader ecosystem, we're a part of the arts, we're part of um, religion, we're a part of community, we're a part of family, those things that often fall to the backdrop in these increasingly modern worlds. What do we need to do as educators to bring those experiences to the forefront and dial them up as well? I really appreciate that point. Okay, we are coming up to the end. I'm gonna add another thing here in the, in the chat. This is a, an article that builds out that two by two that I was just showing you, if you're interested in playing out some more examples um, and looking at that as another resource for you. Um, I'm now spending time thinking about the implications for all of this from an R&D perspective and from the kinds of things that we actually do want to test and learn to help our young people become more full in their human connections and even more alive in this world. And so if you all start to want to test some of this stuff with me, please be in touch through the Rhythm Project. I'm gonna put my email also in the chat, this is what we're trying to do. 
at the Rhythm Project. As it was said at the start of the call, the Rhythm Project has been um, named uh, to signal rhythm, R-I-T-H-M, because of the agency we have in shaping our relationship to technology with algorithms, as well as the heartbeat of humanity. Um, and so uh, last thing I just wanna say, I, I really appreciated, there was several comments in here just about the ethics that our young people are gonna need in order to navigate and lead in this world of AI. And so as we can see, the, this is gonna play out in many different possible ways. And if we ourselves as leaders and our young people are able to interrogate the values that we have and start to imagine the futures that we want versus being passive recipients of what's being built by big tech, I, I really do think we can create the world that our young people both want to be a part of and deserve. So thank you guys for engaging in such a, um, a rich conversation today. Please be in touch if there's any way in which we can kind of build and learn together moving forward. And, um, and I am so grateful for you all. Thank you. Have a great rest of your evening and weekend. And somebody asked about the uh, Spotify, um, which what what music I was playing. I'll play some music in those last few minutes while you guys fill out your <clears throat> your survey. And I did put the um, playlist in the chat too. If you Thank you that. so much for that, Michelle. Uh Friends, there are I think Arshia dropped off. I think she has a little bit of a wobbly internet. But thank you so much, everyone. Please take just two minutes to fill in the feedback form and drop in your reflections from today. And this has been an exciting session. I personally loved the, the chatbot. And I think that was pretty insightful for all of us. And thank you so much, Michelle. This has been wonderful. Um, I think there's a lot to take away for all of us. And yeah. Uh, he was hoping everyone has a great week ahead. Thank you. Hi, are we all still here? Yes, yes, Asha. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Um, I, I'm, okay, I can't see very clearly, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much, Michelle, um, for this wonderful session. Um, okay, um, so honey, uh, so my voice is breaking up. Perhaps you can share as well. Um, uh, but we have another upcoming session next week. We dived into what the future might look like. Um, and next week we go into how do we take our stakeholders within the press into a And just to continue uh, what Arsha was saying and how do we engage the community? Uh, we have a forum with um, Akanksha schools. Uh, you must have heard of it. Uh, this is happening on the 26th. We shall keep you posted on just the details about it as well. And along with this, we also have the Schools of Tomorrow Summit coming up, um, which will be happening in August, the first week of August. Um, we shall share specific details about it as well. Um, and following that up, we also have um, another forum that's happening with problem solvers. Um, Arshia, do you want to shed more light on that? Hi, I'm not sure I'll be able to say this without losing connection. Um, we'll be sharing more information with you guys later um, uh, over email and over WhatsApp. I'd love for us to just close this out, having done the survey. In any case, most of us have dropped off. I don't want to hold you up any longer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. 
Um, we hope to hear more from you soon.